Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, got an interesting topic. Today we'll be talking about uh, PICL outcome data. This is the second time uh, that we've put this outcome data together. Uh, a big thanks to Dustin uh, Berger and uh, our research team for doing this because this takes a lot of time. So I'm going to go over some of that data today uh, and uh, just earlier in the week on Monday, I went over a little snippet of it to talk about those patients who probably aren't a good candidate for the PICL procedure used to treat cranial cervical instability. But today we're going to dive into that even more and try to give you some idea of what that looks like. Now, I think we have enough data here that this is going to uh, make up a publication uh, because I think we have followed enough patients for long enough to be able to publish on this data set. And uh, so we're going to do that. But first, I'm going to share it with you guys before we get that all done, because that process has just started. And normally that'll take a good three or four months to put it all together and then another three or four months for some journal to decide if they want to publish it. So again, we're going to be looking at that uh, second analysis of the PIC outcome data, which included a look at uh, normal patients versus patients with HEDS. So uh, let me get to share my screen here. And uh, I will start. So again, this is the second data analysis for PICL outcome data uh, when used to treat cranial cervical instability. Uh, we did in this one look at hypermobility versus other patients. We had done that once before, but we just didn't have enough HEDS patients in the data set far enough out to, to really make a go of it. It didn't look like before there was a big difference. Uh, but now we have more, so we can try to make a go of this. So uh, just some background. This is the second extensive outcome data analysis that we've performed on PICL. We've looked at this data a couple times, but this is the second one I think I've presented more formally. I got this data in October when I was out, and we had cut off as of July uh, the patient data. It took the team a couple months to get it done. They gave it to me in October, and I'm just now getting around to putting it into a presentation format so that I can share it with uh, the CCI community. Um, again, uh, this is hundreds of hours of work between myself and the research team. Uh, so I really want to thank, in particular, uh, Dustin Berger and Nevin Steinmetz for helping put this together as well as uh, Aaron Dodson for making sure that all this data gets collected. Um, this is really a lot of work. It's not just you push a button and it spits out like this. Um, it was a lot of manual stuff, even though we have an automated system, someone still needs to go into it and say, I'd like this and that and this, et cetera. Uh, the metrics we use are also very unusual. Um, for the most part, when you're using outcome metrics in things like surgical studies, uh, there is no such thing as negative. Either someone has a zero improvement or someone has the maximum improvement or somewhere between those two. So there's usually not a way to even detect someone who says that they're worse. Now, we've always been different in running our treatment registry. We've always allowed those responses. Um, and I think in particular, it's important here to get a sense of, uh, is there a small segment of the patient population that shouldn't be doing this procedure? And I started talking about that on Monday. But again, you just don't see this in surgical studies where they would even have a metric that can go backwards. It, it's either zero or forwards. But we do include a metric, the single assessment numeric evaluation that allows patients to report if in their perception, they're worse. Um, and again, I'm gonna publish this data in a peer-reviewed journal. That's gonna take a while, um, probably the next three or four months to put together. I've already started writing that paper, 
but it's going to take a few months. I'll write it. Uh, we'll get some help from the fellow. Uh, we'll have the entire team read it. Uh, we'll probably go through five or six revisions before we submit it. And then it's usually three or four, could be up to six months before we hear back, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a slow process, but my hope is I can get it in press uh, this year, uh, 2023, so that we can have something out there. So unlike, and, and at that point, we'll be equal to what's been published in the surgical literature, right? Because there are no randomized controlled trials on any of these surgeries that the CCI patients get. Um, there's really just uh, case series that are uh, that go from small to medium size. This will actually be a large case series. And unlike all of those surgeries, we actually have an ongoing randomized controlled trial with a sham group, meaning that you can be put into the category that gets treatment that's real or fake. And so I'd really, really like anyone to reach out who has an in or anyone who has interest in that to reach out to us. Uh, Aaron Dodson is the person that does that screening. She's our clinical research coordinator. So if you're interested in something like that, it is a no charge, but you've got to be qualified into it based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And you also have to accept the fact that you're kind of delaying treatment for a good six months plus because you're going to get two uh, sham treatments or two real treatments. Now, you can go to the other group if you got the sham treatment, so you'll eventually get the real treatment, um, but realize that that's the case with a randomized controlled trial. So this is what all this looks like. The bottom line is, you know, we basically went ahead and got down to uh, 229 patients and almost a thousand surveys that had been filled out that met the criteria here. Now we've treated a lot more patients than that, but we were trying to make sure we had all the data in these patients. We were trying to make sure that they were after a certain time frame and before a certain time frame, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to look at these, what are called PROMs, patient reported outcome metrics. So the SF36 is more of a generalized questionnaire about overall patient health. Uh, the neck disability index is what it sounds like. It's a disability functional questionnaire uh, with regard to folks with neck problems. Now, not 100% of our CCI patients have a, a ton of neck pain. Most of them do. Uh, but some of them don't. So obviously, uh, that's the reason why we use lots of different metrics here. So we have a headache impact test or HIT-6, where we've got uh, the ability to measure the effect of what's going on with someone's headache. And then we have a pain score. Again, not all of our CCI patients have high pain scores. Uh, and then finally, we have this SANE, uh, the Single Assessment Numeric Evaluation, and that's from negative 100% worse to 100% better. Um, and that's the one that we allow to go backwards because we're interested to see if uh, patients are reporting that they're worse and which patients are reporting that they're probably just sort of generally worse over time and which patients that's probably related to the procedure. And again, realize that even the same as it's published only goes from zero to 100 it doesn't go backwards. So we created a special version or a modified SANE that allows it to go backwards. So this is the patient demographic data. Uh, patients were in general middle-aged, slightly overweight, and uh, the average follow-up time was 1.3 years. Uh, the minimum follow-up time was a couple months, so they had to have at least the three-month post uh, in place. And then uh, obviously for some of these patients, uh, they go back a couple of years, so 1500 days. Um, but that's not every single patient we've treated, right? We've been doing this procedure all the way going back to 2015, so seven years. But on average about 1.3 years out from the procedure, that means that the vast majority of these patients uh, would have had one or two treatments by the time we checked so this is incredibly important information here to understand, and that is the, the neck disability index. Um, 
It is what it sounds like. It measures the disability level. And this is before the PICL procedure. So this is good just to get a sense of how severe is this patient population? And the answer is it's pretty darn severe. Um, these are the numbers given out by the folks that make the neck disability index. So if you're in this range, you've got mild neck disability. And as you can see, that's the minority of the patient. So each one of these dots represents a patient and where they were on the NDI. And you're going to be seeing a lot of these dots because that's how these things go. These dots represent individual patients. So it allows us to see clusters and where patients live. And then we go up to moderate, right? There's a few more patients in the moderate disability category. We have the vast majority of our patients, however, that are in the severe disability category or the complete disability category. So either severely disabled or completely disabled is probably, if you look at that, about 65% or two thirds of the patients, maybe 60%, about 40% you are either mild or moderately disabled. So this is a very disabled group of people. Um, so we're not talking about a lot of patients with mild neck issues or even moderate neck issues. Most of them have severe neck issues or their neck issues are so bad that they cause complete disability. So these are the baseline numbers. And really the only thing that looks interesting here is that the hypermobile patients had in general a trend towards poorer health. Um, and that makes sense because hypermobile patients have other issues other than just their, their neck problem. Um, so it would make sense that they would probably be less active, uh, more depressed about it, uh, et cetera, because they don't just have a neck problem. They've got other problems in other areas as well. OK, so here's the data. So this is the baseline versus the last. And realize that, you know, we're looking at means here or do the means change in a way that is appropriate. So uh, when you see the statistical numbers here, P equals 0, 0, 0, 001, um, you know, we're looking for anything uh, above P equals 0 0.01 uh, or 0 0.05. So the bottom line is this just shows these changes are statistically significant in these groups. Um, so, and what I did here is since each of these metrics that we measure go different directions for improvement, some of them improvement, the score goes up. Some of the improvement, the score goes down. And so the check mark means that in all of these, uh, we were seeing statistically significant improvements. So when it comes to pain, uh, that's a check. Uh, when it comes to neck function, yes, improved. Um, the portion of the SF36 that measures patient energy, improved. General health through the SF36, improved physical limits, meaning limitations improved, their percent improvement uh, was statistically significant, and uh, that's the SANE score. And then the pain portion of the SF36 improved, overall physical function portion of the SF36 improved, overall well-being improved, social function improved, uh, emotional limits, meaning uh, emotional impacts of all this, and then headaches improved. So that's all good news. Um, the question then comes, how do you take all the statistical stuff and turn it into something that patients can more easily understand? Um, now, I'll do that here in a second. But before we jump into that, um, which I also went over on Monday, uh, this just looks at the normal versus hypermobile. Now, we're still not. We've only still got 36 hypermobile patients in here. So I, I can't rule out that if we look at this next year and we have 136, that these things might change. But we finally have enough to start putting some weight on the idea that we're not seeing uh, huge uh 
differences between these uh, two patient groups, meaning normal ligament and hypermobile. Now, an area where we do see some maybe changes is that I think the hypermobile patients after this amount of treatment are reporting a trend towards less uh, percentage improvement. And uh, there may be a slight difference in improvement in their headaches, but the rest of this stuff didn't really detect that. So at the end of the day, there may be some differences here, but the differences are not something that are jumping off the page. And we'll look at this again, uh, probably this next summer, uh, where maybe we can have 100 or more hypermobile patients in this data set. So we'll see how that goes. But right now, um, we're not seeing a huge difference. So this is the rubber meets the road part of this because it's incredibly important to understand. And that is, how can I put this into terms that a patient will easily get? So I've been saying for a long time that it felt to me like about seven in 10 patients were reporting significant improvements. So this is this single assessment numeric outcome. So this is the percentage of improvement. So you can see here all the way from uh, no change to all the way up to 100% improved. Now, if I look at this and see where most of these patients live, and I, I, I break this out because 15% here is about what patients can determine, and I get rid of this middle category because it's really where the statistical balance lives, the vast majority of patients are improving up here. So I'm gonna say that when I looked at these numbers, even though it says same or better around 90%, about seven in 10 of our patients are reporting significant improvements. And it's also important to notice, and I talked about this, that we have about 5% of the patients or about one in 20 that are reporting that they are not better. And in fact, on the same number, which we allow to go backwards, which is unusual, they're reporting some worsening. And, and if we look at these numbers here for saying, you know, this data point is in that world of hard to determine, meaning if someone says they're 8% worse, it's gotta be at least 15% for that number to be valid. So that we're gonna have to throw out. And if I look at these number, these two up here, I'm gonna say, well, that could just be part of what happens over time. But these patients over here are people who I would say at the end of the day, uh, may be legitimately worse from the procedure. Now, if we look at the worst analysis, uh, I was just informed recently that one of those patients in that data set who had reported being a lot worse is now reporting that she's almost 90% better. Uh, this is a patient who had a huge flare up and at the six month uh, time point was still substantially worse. But at the one year time point is doing very, very well or close to the one year time point. So the question is what percentage of those patients are going to switch categories at some point, and I don't know the answer to that yet. My overall sense would be that uh, there's a chunk of them that will end up uh, the same or better, but that's gonna be a, something we'll be taking a look at. So in conclusion, about seven in 10 patients are reporting significant improvements, about one in 20 or worse at three to six months. But again, it's hard to say how many of those patients will eventually convert to no change or better. And uh, there wasn't a lot of difference between the normal ligament and EDS groups, but that could change. We're, we're, we'll take another look at it here when we've got more data. And we're gonna publish this data set in a peer reviewed journal, which uh, I've already talked about. So let me uh, go ahead and I'll get out of this and see if we've got any questions. Again, as always, you can ask questions about this. You can ask questions about anything, uh, not just this particular topic. Okay, so let's see. Submit advance by Edward Chen. Any suggestions for CCI literate physical therapists in Canada, more specifically Ontario? 
Ontario. Um, you know, uh, Ed, I, I don't. Now, we do have a offhand. Now, we do have a list that we use of uh, physical therapists who are very knowledgeable in this area. Um, so just ping Carla and she can uh, see if there's anyone on that list. Uh, Ed, has anyone tried to do a C1 star arthroplasty with success on a live patient? Is this anatomically possible? Um, no, I've never seen anyone try to do a C1, C2 arthroplasty. The, the biggest problem, meaning just so that we know what Ed's talking about, is the use of something like an artificial joint in uh, the C1, C2 area. The biggest, there's going to be a couple of technical difficulties there. The first thing is you've got to put something that has fairly substantial mass to it, um, maybe the size of a nickel, but thicker. Um, and you've got to get it in there. Um, so getting it in there is going to do an awful lot of damage. You'll probably have to sacrifice the occipital nerve to do it. Realize the vertebral artery is right there, which can be damaged and cause a brainstem stroke. Um, and also realize that at the end of the day, once you get it in there, if it slips out uh, and it goes backwards, then that could cause a spinal cord injury. Um, and you've got this weird scenario where 50% of all the rotation happens at that joint. So unlike the discs, which only allow a very small amount of motion each one, that particular joint allows 50% of your total head rotation. Um, so it's a big, big uh, problem to be solved. Now, maybe one day, can they solve it? Uh, sure, they may be able to 3D print a joint. There may be other things coming down the pike, but right now I, I think the technology would not be there. Pino, what do you know about the study claiming cartilage regeneration do anything different than you do? Uh, I don't know what study that is. Let's see if I can. I don't think I can copy and paste that regrettably. Yeah, I don't think I can copy and paste that to look it up, but do me a favor. I'll put my email down here. And send me the actual link because it's a little bit long for me to type in right now. It's going to take time away from other patients. But I certainly I'm putting my email down in the comments. So uh, do me a favor and, and just send me the link and I'll, I'll look at it. Uh, I monitor those fairly closely and there's nothing that's really great out there right now. But who knows? Maybe it's something different. Uh, it's been advanced by... Ed, in your video entitled False Negative Imaging of the ADI, we saw a patient master ADI using their neck musculature, but muscles prevent ADI from opening up. Can these muscles be strengthened to some extent through physical therapy? Um, possible. Um, as far as what muscles would be responsible for stabilizing an ADI, um, it could be a number of different muscle groups. Uh, one, I don't think this has ever been published on, so I'm really... Uh, hypothesis, uh, generating a hypothesis here, but it would be probably the longest capitis. Um, it certainly could be some of the small segmental muscles uh, that go and act on uh, C1 and C2 from the back. So by all means, strengthening all stabilization muscles, uh, always a great idea unless you do it. And the problem I think with our CCI patients is that many can't do it. So uh, that's generally what happens um, and they will flare up. But if you can do it by all means, uh, Harry Winston, are there any supplements that we can take that may help until we get to you for treatment? You know, that Regenix support formula, we've had a lot of patients report good things about that. High dose fish oil, um, uh, curcumin with uh, bioperine, um, glucosamine, uh, chondroitin, MSM, all of those things are, are supplements that have more research that show that they tend to help this kind of pain. Um, so those are some things to consider. Uh, it's been advanced by Harry Winston. Have you noticed a difference in PICL results in men or women? 
you know, we haven't noticed uh, a difference there. Uh, I was thinking of some other subgroup analysis that we can now do now that we have enough patients, because the problem with breaking men and women is easy, right? Because it's only 50-50 or thereabouts. So you'll end up getting a good number of people in each group if you have 200 and something patients in your group. But when you start to slice and dice and you get into five different subgroups and you only have 50 patients, obviously then you don't have enough to make a go of it. But we're finally at that point where we can slice and dice and do some subgroup analysis. So I am going to ask Dustin to do that here. Uh, but men and women, no. Ulysses, uh, Dr. Centeno, I really need your help. One is me trying to telemed so you can review my images for C0 to C2 so you can give authorization for genetics to do it. I'm tired of being in pain. Yeah, Ulysses, we don't authorize any regenic sites to treat the upper cervical spine uh, simply because they're so, that's so high risk. So the only option would be coming out to Colorado. Uh, there are no options. I think if I recall, you're in the New York metro area. So there are no options up there. Uh, yeah, Lissy, I can't, I can't help you. I'm reading some of the, your other comments here. Um, I, I can't make providers understand this. I can't make providers have the experience in injecting those areas. Uh, it's not possible. There's, there's only one place on the face of the earth that gets that kind of experience in injecting zero one and one two, and that's in Colorado. So I'm not sure what to tell you there. Daniel, uh, if holding AO adjustment 10 months and counting, but symptoms isn't improving, is PICL needed or posterior PRP a better start? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I think we would look at that the same way we would look at pretty much any uh, patient, and that would be at the end of the day, um, what does the stability look like when we challenge it? So what I mean by that is that in medicine, there's been long this idea, and especially in orthopedic and, and spine care of stress films, right? We take a part, this is done for ankle ligament injuries as well. And you take an x-ray when you're not stressing it. And then for an ankle, you stress it. Then you take another x-ray and see if the parts move too much. Same thing in the spine, uh, for lumbar spine, you can do flexion and extension x-rays to see if something's unstable. And for the upper cervical spine, uh, best to do digital motion x-ray. So if the digital motion x-ray shows instability, then I would say uh, more PICL. If it doesn't show a lot of instability at this point, then more posterior PRP. That's been advanced by Sherry. How does pregnancy affect CCI? Is there a problem getting the PICL procedure while pregnant? How long after a C-section would I need to wait to do the PICL procedure because of blood loss? You know, Sherry, that's a good question. Um, as far as pregnancy affecting ligaments in general, we know that in the last trimester of pregnancy, there's a hormone release called relaxin. And the goal of that hormone, we believe, is to relax the ligaments uh, around the SI joints and symphysis pubis and the birth canal to allow the birth canal to expand as safely as the baby's head goes through. So because of that, you may experience more instability towards the uh, end of your pregnancy. And obviously then that goes back to normal usually. Uh, as far as getting a PICL procedure during pregnancy, that wouldn't be safe in my uh, medical opinion. And then how long after C-section, um, probably you'd want to wait a couple months um, if you had any blood loss. So that blood loss is replaced a couple months to give the baby the best possible start through breastfeeding, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Era, how can I reliably find out my level of muscle atrophy in our neck muscles and whether muscle or ligaments are the main culprit of my instability? Well, Eric, you can certainly, I think I did a video on this. You may want to look on the YouTube channel and just type in there um, uh, muscle atrophy. It'll probably come up uh, and it shows you how to look at those uh, MRIs to try to see if there's muscle atrophy. Now, whether or not there's ligament instability would be that digital motion x-ray is the best way to do that. Sometimes I can see it on a flexion extension MRI, but if we had to place a bet, 
on which imaging technology would be the most likely to show CCI if it's present, DMX would be the winner there. I don't know how to say that. THM, SV, RGS. Uh, do traumatic injury suffering patients have an easier time of healing from transverse ligament damage? Um, yeah, actually, this brings up a good point. Uh, and that is that if we can get to patients who are traumatically injured early, oftentimes it's a one and done treatment. Um, and I'm actually going to hopefully Monday I'll do this, if not Friday. I'm still waiting for one of the doctors to get me information back. But we had a unique situation that came up recently. We had this last year, we had two uh, MDs uh, and one uh uh, mid-level uh, uh, nurse practitioner or physician's assistant who uh, was was able to diagnose this stuff early after trauma, meaning they self-diagnosed themselves. Um, two of them were connected to our clinic already, so they, they knew they could get this. So it didn't take that long, maybe a month or two, for them to figure out what, which end was up and what was going on which is unusual, as you know, many CCI patients don't get to this that quickly. And then we had uh, the mid-level practitioner who had heard about us. And so she did some research and she quickly figured this out. All three of these got patients got amazing results after a single treatment, um, primarily because I believe they picked it up so quickly that some of the more chronic issues that happen in this patient population didn't have a chance to set in. Um, so it's an interesting uh, discussion and I'll probably do it this Monday, if not this coming Friday, uh, but I'd like to have that discussion because I'm gonna have them put it in their own words what they did and how they got so quickly in to get treated and, and what happened. Uh, Regenix Collector Broken told me this morning I had to call your clinic so I can meet you on Zoom so you can review everything up neck. Uh, yeah, Alyssa, we don't recommend any Regenix clinics at this point to do upper cervical injections. There's, it's just too high risk unless you do this stuff all day, every day. You got to realize, I think we've had this conversation now many, many times on this type of venue um, that, you know, let, let's just take my schedule, right? Um, how many zero one injections uh, will be done in the entire Metro New York area by every single medical provider this year. Uh, we could probably add that up on our hands and toes. So under 20. Um, I would do 20 zero ones um, sometimes in a week, uh, but definitely in a month as a single provider. Um, and in our clinic, uh, you can usually double that. Um, so we're doing more zero ones than all of the medical providers. Uh, and, and now we're talking about several hundred medical providers in the entire Northeast. Uh, and we do more in a single month than they would do in an entire year. And that's divided by all of those medical providers. So you, you get a sense there of, of the experience difference. And this is one where experience makes a huge, huge difference. So uh, I'm not quite sure how I can say that differently because I know I've said it a bunch of times. Kristen, do you see people who have problems with inflammation have a hard time healing? I'm having a flare with inflammation, but started getting good healing results at 4.5 out. I want to work on muscles that know their atrophy, but I do flare up when doing resistance bands, worry about the inflammation. Hoping when misalignment gets addressed, things will get better those uh, through this flare up. It's just wanting inflammation prevents them from healing. Yeah, Kristen, so it's cr incredibly important to realize that we have that patient population and whether it's inflammation or central sensitization that uh, have these prolonged flare ups, uh, and it sounds like you really took three or four months to get through that flare up. And I would say that's maybe one in 10 of our patients, one in seven, one in eight. Well, that's about one in 10 who are at that 
that length of flare up. Um, so I would agree with you. I wouldn't uh, aggressively push the exercise at this point um, because you probably won't tolerate it. So you have to be really, really careful with that. Um, but it's an important point to bring up that we do have patients that have that prolonged period of recovery. And whether it's central sensitization, inflammation, or both, it's, uh, it's definitely... Uh, makes those patients, as you, you've experienced, it's a harder recovery than many patients experience. Liam, uh, I loved your recent blog about the one two joint. Uh, yeah, thank you, Liam. That was a uh, that one was a bit intense, as I put there, uh, meaning that I had started kind of writing the opening to uh, the paper and uh, decided to review all this stuff and then try to tweak it a little bit so patients could read it, but thank you. Uh, you wrote the cartilage covered joint surfaces would be traumatized one joint surface falls forward in the other. This definitely happens to my one too, but it seems to be improving very slowly. Is there any way to heal this trauma of the joint surfaces? Yeah, so Liam, that's why uh, intraarticular uh, fluoroscopy and contrast documented injections into those facet joints is such a critical part of PICL because between injecting PRP and or bone marrow concentrate into those joints, we can provide some healing within the joint. Um, and many of our patients have had a lot of trauma in those joints for the exact reason that you're bringing up. So that's why injecting these joints, which I was just talking to Ulysses about, Ulysses about uh, is, is just so critical uh, and such a critical part of what we do. Uh, one is obviously providing the stability, but the two is trying to get that joint trauma to heal. And the only way to do that is to put that stuff directly in the joint and to document that you're doing it. But as we've talked about, if you don't do it all day, that can be a high risk endeavor. Liam, uh, I know that's good to be as active and functional as possible after PSL to dynamically load the ligaments but it's hard to know when there's too much activity or load. If an activity causes a mild flare and a symptom, but only lasts for a couple hours or so, should that activity be avoided? Yeah, Liam, that's a great, great question because it's such a critical concept to understand when you're healing from an injury or whether you're healing from this type of procedure. And that is that there's this, there's, I call it the, the ledge. Um, and, you know, basically you can walk the person, I don't know how to do this here backwards on my hands, but you can walk the person right up to the ledge, but you don't want them to go over the ledge. Um, and what I mean by that is that you should load it enough where if you have just a mild increase that only lasts a short period of time, then you've probably pushed it right up to the edge of that ledge, which is not a, usually a problem. But if you get a flare up that pushes you over the ledge, and that means that you're getting a flare up that lasts a day or two or three or more, then you went too far. And so that's an excellent point to bring up that there is that concept of the ledge when you're in recovery and you wanna push it right up to the ledge because loading will help healing but not over the ledge. So thank you very much for bringing that up. That's a great, great question. Robert, how many other areas can you cover with stem cells during a PICL? Does it only cover the PICL or does it also cover the facets? Yeah, Robert, we routinely, well, so let, let me break this again into two different patient types. So for, let's say one in five patients that we would consider a fragile egg or someone who has central sensitization, we're only going to cover the PICL. But in four in five patients, or 80%, who can we know or are pretty certain who can tolerate much more, we're going to do it all. So that means that we're going to do the PICL portion from the front. We're going to do the ligaments in the back. We're going to do the upper cervical facets. We're going to do other areas that may need to be treated in patients that are particularly able to tolerate a lot of care. So for instance, this week, uh, in patients, you know, I did, I'm just going off the top of my head, PICL, we did the upper cervical facets, we did the posterior ligaments, 
Uh, in two of the patients, we did a lower cervical facet overfill to the epidural space. In one of the patients, we did the bilateral shoulder ligaments. Uh, another patient, we added in the sternoclavicular joint because it was lax. So uh, normally, PICL includes lots of different parts and pieces. It's only in those patients who are in that fragile aid category where we go the other direction and try to do as little as possible to see how they're going to respond before we open that up and do more. Uh, Ulysses, if I find a provider who does ultrasound from upper neck, can I show them a post about how to do it? <laughs> you can't. Oh, Ulysses. Man, I, I, I'm not quite sure how many times I can say this, but it is a good point, and I think it's a point that everyone needs to understand. Um, these are rarefied air procedures. So again, as I just said, if we take the entire Northeast, I don't know how many people are in the Northeast, but there has to be minimum hundreds of interventional pain providers, right? Maybe a thousand uh, in the Northeast. Um, those thousand providers would do fewer of these procedures that we're talking about than our clinic does in a month uh, with three providers doing them. Uh, and most of those being done by myself and then a, a few less by Dr. Schultz and then going down from there. Uh, so you can't learn to do these things by paint by number. Uh, you can't learn to do these things by reading a blog. Uh, you can't even learn to do them by taking a weekend course. And you, pr you can't even learn to do them after a year long fellowship. You've got to develop this expertise over years by doing these procedures in high enough volume where you can understand all of the different anatomical variants so you don't, don't hurt people. Uh, so no, uh, someone can't read a blog and learn how to do that. And ultrasound would be a dangerous way to do it anyway, which is what that blog talks about. But it is a good point, And it brings up that concept that I have to drive home. These are are difficult procedures to perform. They take immense amount of time and training to do correctly. And they take repetition at enough volume where you're understanding all of the bad things that can go wrong and how to avoid those bad things. And uh, I know who this is. <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys do, um, but uh, this is our, uh, Ukrainian patient, um, uh, just because of the Cyrillic there. Uh, and uh, so uh, what exercises can PACL patients do after four months of recovery? Given what I know about your outstanding recovery after the first treatment, um, uh, contact Carla and she can get you those exercises to start doing. But uh, great to hear from you that you're doing well. I got your email this week. So thank you for sending that. It, it was very nice. Uh, Jennifer, are there any options left for treating C0 to C2 instability? PICL is physically not possible due to small mouth size. Um, the only thing we could do is from the back. Um, uh, I don't know that we've had that many patients. We've had to uh, say that we can't do it from the front due to small mouth size. Um, it is possible that you may need to come in and uh, we may need to alter some of the 3D printed mouthpieces to fit. Um, now, maybe there could be an issue uh, that you're discussing of not being able to open the mouth wide enough because of TMJ. We have seen that once or twice. Um, so if we can't do it from the front, the only thing we could do is the posterior ligaments and those upper cervical joints. Uh, we won't be able to get access to the ALAR and transverse. Gotcha, Kristen, yeah. So again, that same discussion of, you know, this uh, having that prolonged flare. Era, uh, what would cause the inner neck muscles to go very flaccid? I have a ton of movement since recently. Is it possible to treat AI and CCI with poor neck muscle functioning? Yeah, Era, the vast majority of our patients would have pretty severe muscle atrophy in the upper neck. So that's pretty typical for the PICL uh, procedure. Now, what causes those muscles to go south? 
That's a great question. Uh, there's an entire literature base being published by Jim Elliott out of Northwestern on that particular topic. Um, and they're not 100% sure. Um, it could have to do with injuries to the joints, which then shuts down the muscles in order to protect those joints, but eventually the muscles go south. Um, it could have to do with the instability and the muscles getting overworked. It could have to do with nerve injury. No one's 100% sure. Um, and Jim Elliott probably knows more about that muscle atrophy than any other human on earth. Uh, Jim used to be our physical therapist way back when, before he got his PhD, went to Australia, came back, and then ultimately um, uh, became the world's expert on upper cervical muscle atrophy. Robert, Brian Scheipel, and PA, does ultrasound and C0? Uh, yeah, Robert, uh, please don't recommend uh, that. That It's not safe to do under ultrasound. Uh, I don't care how good you are with an ultrasound probe. Uh, you can't see if you're in the artery. So definitely don't recommend that or agree with that recommendation. Uh, stable on three, can you explain more about how you diagnose nerve injur injuries and what the process for treating damaged nerves looks like? Plate lysate, have you treated nerve damage linked to balanced vision symptoms? I'm not quite sure what you mean with that last part as far as treating nerve injury. Uh, that's usually a platelet lysate hydrodissection. So it's injecting platelet growth factors around the damaged nerve. Um, and depending on where the nerve lives, that can be done under uh, fluoroscopy guidance or ultrasound guidance. Um, and you need to tell me more about what specific nerve damage you're talking about. On the PICL, do you get the 0, uh, 1, 2 facet from anterior as well? Um, it can be done from anterior with PICL. It uh, wouldn't be recommended because we're frequently trying to avoid that to get into the ligaments. But yes, those can be done from anterior um, as well. I'm just trying to get rid of uh, some of these crazy uh, posts from the girls' site here. Ulysses, uh, yeah, I'm going to focus on C37, the rest of body parts. Let's see. Sounds great. Great, bottom. Sometimes I wish C1 and 2 have a disc between the others. Um, yeah, it's definitely different for sure. Here, Robert, again, the, the issue here is what I've been talking about, frequency. So let's take the entire state of Pennsylvania. In the entire state of Pennsylvania, we probably have, I'm going to imagine, at least 100 providers who do interventional spine. The total number of zero ones done by those 100 providers um, in Pennsylvania on, a, on an annual basis would be fewer than I do in a month. Uh, so again, I, I can't, uh, I can't, if I can't get it across, it, it's, important because we just saw a very severe patient complication. This patient is probably never going to be the same. Uh, she's currently in uh, uh, inpatient rehab and there was a brainstem injury caused by a provider who otherwise was a very experienced interventional spine doctor, but didn't do enough of these to really recognize what was going on during the procedure. So all it took was being slightly off and slightly heading the wrong direction and probably not having the experience to recognize what was going on for that to happen. So I, I can't emphasize enough that what that really showed me at that point, because we had referred to this provider before, was that unless you're doing hundreds of these procedures a year, you can't reliably do them safely. Uh, and it's just like everything else uh, out there, um, meaning that the more you do it, the better you are. So if you look at, you know, there's lots of different articles in medicine, uh, places that do 50 knee replacements a year are pretty bad at knee replacement. Um, patients that do, or places that do a thousand are really good at knee replacement. They've got fewer complications, they've got better outcomes. And it's just like anything else, right? No different. 
Uh, Kimmy just joined. You have the documented results like this for post your PRP and CCI patients. Uh, when did our when we did our consultation, I was proof of PSL this morning about PRP only. Um, I think if you're talking about posterior PRP, um, we generally don't treat CCI patients with posterior PRP, meaning that the outcomes there are about one in five um, improving rather than seven in 10. So that's the problem uh, for CCI patients. Now, if there's not CCI and what we're treating is just an upper cervical facet injury, then that works much, much better from the back. Um, but you need to be uh, to understand that if you're in that CCI category, we certainly allow patients to try that. And it's mostly so the patient can gain trust in the process. Um, and who knows, they may be in that one in five. Um, so it's certainly a reasonable thing for that patient to try. It's just not a high likelihood of success. Uh, THM, SV, RGS, I don't know how to say that, uh, with transverse ligament damage that normal for the neck muscles tighten up and cause issues with breathing and swallowing. Well, certainly with uh, swallowing, uh, because that would cause the, the atlas and the, to move forward, and right in front of that atlas would be those muscles of swallowing. So there's not that big a distance there, maybe a centimeter between where the atlas lives and where those muscles involved in swallowing uh, live. All of the, I mean, all of the muscles involved in swallowing, it's not just one. On the breathing side, uh, that could be other issues, or it might just be generalized tightness in the scalenes. Realize the scalenes are secondary muscles of respiration, and they come in through here and they go quite high. So if the scalenes are in spasm, trying to st stabilize the upper neck or help with that stability, you're going to lose those accessory muscles of respiration. So when you take a deep breath in, part of that is the diaphragm, but the other part of that comes from these scalenes and they assist in that. So you're probably losing that assist in taking a breath and that could be perceived by difficulty with breathing, or you may have other rib issues that have yet to be diagnosed. Uh, Ulysses, is there a difference between old ultrasound guidance, uh, new ultrasound guidance? Um, you'd have to go back a good ways there. Um, I think for the last 10 years or so, we've had better ultrasound machines um, that are a cut above what was available 20 years ago. In the last five years, how much difference is there? Not that much. So let me just give it a percentage. So if I had a 20 year old ultrasound machine, uh, let's say that would give me an image quality of three out of 10. Uh, current image quality is about an eight out of 10. So there's a big difference there between a 20 year old machine and anything done in the last 10 years. Now, if I compare ultrasound machines for the last five years versus the previous five years, We've maybe gone from a 7 out of 10 to an 8 out of 10, something like that. Um, so not as big a difference there, but certainly when comparing machines from 20 years ago where the images were awful. And hopefully they'll get to 9 or 10 out of 10 as the artificial intelligence behind some of those algorithms that make the picture look pretty and allows you to see the needle gets better and better. So in 10 years, we'll probably have machines that throw – that throw up a full 3D manipulable image that shows you the exact course of the needle through that 3D volume. Uh, those don't exist yet, but I would imagine they're not too far out, five years, 10 years. And that then we may get to a place where ultrasound can approach um, uh, serum fluoroscopy for accuracy at those mid to high depths but just not there yet. Era, about injecting PRP only, uh, which you just mentioned, in what situation is that usually effective? What kind of instability? Yeah, so we do PRP from the back. We can also do bone marrow from the back, but uh, more commonly PRP. So what kind of instability would uh, be a really common thing we would treat? Uh, a real common one we see is, is all we see is the C2 bone has gone forward on the C3 bone. In that particular case, uh, treating from the back can be very effective. 
Now, if we're talking about the side to side instability that we see with atlantoaxial uh, instability or C1C2 overhang, it's not going to do much. Jennifer, have you heard a patient try PRP after subround stem cells with stem cells didn't yield positive results? No, I'd need to know what it is we're talking about there. Uh, stem cells for what? PRP for what? What kind of procedures were done? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd have to know what it was we were treating. In addition, patients call stem cells a lot of things. Um, so I'd need to know what that was specifically. Uh, race, does someone need to have Lyme epidemic to other co infection remission before they can see a success of PICL? How these infections back tissue healing? Yeah, Race, I, I, I don't do the whole Lyme thing, uh, meaning that I don't believe we've got good peer reviewed research showing that Lyme infections cause these issues. Um, in fact, I think I've got a, um, a video I did on that maybe six months ago that you might want to pull down. Um, so when it comes to that kind of stuff, I, I don't go there. Um, having said that, a lot of our patients uh, report that they've been diagnosed by a functional medicine practitioner with Lyme, and it doesn't seem to impact outcome based on what I've seen. Um, so that's the best I can tell you. Lori, very few providers have DMX machine. Hospitals don't have them. Yeah, I would agree with you, Lori, that's a problem. Uh, and uh, it's a problem we face on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the good news is there's probably 20 to 30 good DMX sites around the country we can recommend. So we can frequently get a DMX done. Uh, but you're right, it's not going to be at the local hospital. It'll be in a private clinic. Uh, have other patients mentioned something like a menthol feeling in their ears when blood flow is restored through the vertebral artery? I don't know. Uh, it's not one I hear a lot of, uh, but certainly maybe that would be a good thing to go into the PICL group on Facebook and, and ask other patients. Magda, hydroxyteto, is bone marrow draw done from the same site for second PICL? Uh, and it's number one. Uh, that depends on patient sex and age. So if the patient is uh, over 50, then it should be done at a different site. Uh, than the first, if the patient, and, and well, the patient is female and, and over 50. If the patient is female and under 50, um, or they're male, then there is no problem going to the same site. Uh, and that's based on some research that I think got accepted for publication. If it didn't, it's still out there waiting to be published. I'm not quite sure. I don't recall. Um, okay, guys, so we are approaching... Uh, 2 p.m. and an hour. So I will uh, start finishing up and start to take the last couple of questions here. Uh, Jennifer, do you know of a DMX uh, near Sacramento, California? I was told you have to come to Colorado to get it done. You know, I don't. Uh, that's a question for Carla. Carla is our DMX expert as to what's where. I know we have a California site. I believe it's Southern California. Um and I want to say, I just looked at one of theirs this morning. I'm trying to find out where that is for you. Um, I believe it's in Woodland Hills, California. I don't know where that is, so I'm just Googling it here. So it looks like that's north of L.A. near Santa Monica, uh, Santa Monica Park. Um, so it looks like that's north of L.A. We've used that site before, um, and they seem to do a good job, so that may be something to consider. But it's in Woodland Hills, but I would ask Carla that. I'm going to put Carla's email right down here so you have it. Okay, so I just put Carla's uh, in the uh, Carla's email in the comments there. Uh, Jennifer, you can explain again the PRP positive results for forward and aft movement as user for stem cells. 
side to side. Um, so if we're talking about not uh, not forward and aft, but an anterolis thesis of two on three. So that means uh, two moving forward on three in flexion. That would be the only thing that could be treated there. That would be treated by injecting ligaments back here. How often does that work? Um, you could do that with either prolotherapy or PRP. And uh, that works about 80% of the time. Um, so it can be highly effective if you've got that uh, instability. Now, bone marrow concentrate, which was what you're calling stem cells, but the name for it is bone marrow concentrate, um, treating side to side instability is a seven in 10. Kimmy, thank you. With posterior PRP, uh, would that possibly help a malrotated C2? I see an AO, but we can't quite get C2 where it needs to be. Neck muscles are atrophied. Um, usually not. So usually that chronic uh, C1, C2 rotational instability, if you look at my blog just this week, uh, so I'm going to take you to that blog to show you where it lives. So this is that blog. Uh, how does the body stabilize the C1-C2 joint, the role of the ALR ligament? It goes all through what you're discussing, how that C1-C2 joint works, why it tends to get out of place, uh, how the ALR ligament and the muscles are involved in stabilizing that joint. Uh, and, uh, and so, no, that would be uh, more that PICL procedure, not posterior PIP. Yeah, Jennifer, I, I'm not sure how to help you there. I mean, certainly 400 miles away is, is far closer than, than here. So really up to you there. Um, is ultrasound good for the low back and mid back or x-ray guidance? Um, Ulysses, it just depends on what we're injecting. So, um, for example, doing an epidural injection, uh, the standard would be x-ray guidance with contrast. Uh, doing a ligament injection in the low back uh, or mid back when we're injecting some of the superficial ligaments or SI joint ligaments, uh, ultrasound works just fine. Uh, for a facet injection, the standard would be x-ray guidance with contrast. Um, uh, could it be done under ultrasound guidance? Yeah, it just can't be done well. Um, but those aren't as high risk as doing all this stuff that we talked about up here. Uh, race. Uh, has Regen Med been able to reinstate disc height or regrow a heel the nucleus pulposus on a herniated disc? Um, as far as regrowing disc height, no. Um, as far as healing, uh, I think you're talking about an annular tear. The answer is yes. We've got pretty good evidence based on MRI that that can be done. Oh, sure. Uh, happy to help. Uh, I think you're, you're misunderstanding regulations there. Uh, so FDA approval is for drugs or for uh, more than minimally manipulated biologics. It has nothing to do with medical procedures. So knee arthroscopy, for instance, isn't FDA approved. It's not even possible for it to get FDA approved because uh, it's a medical procedure. Uh, lumbar fusion is not FDA approved. FDA would have nothing to do with medical procedures. So uh, that's just drugs, devices. So for instance, uh, for a lumbar fusion, the device that's implanted would be FDA approved. The surgery, the FDA has got nothing to do with. Uh, Ulysses, can a bulge disc heal faster? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Uh, do you mean if we use orthobiologics, can we get a acute bulging disc to heal faster? I don't think anyone knows that. Um, can we heal a bulging disc with orthobiologics? In my clinical experience, the only time I've seen that done is using the culture expanded cells that we use down in Grand Cayman. And that actually goes back to the last question. Uh, we're using those in Grand Cayman because they're not that product 
requires FDA approval as a drug. It's not FDA approved here, although it's in a phase two clinical trial here. That's actually our technology. Um, okay, guys, so I am going to start shutting it down. Um, going to uh, get started on my weekend, uh, I think, a little bit early here, or at least parts of it. Uh, so what we talked about today was the data behind uh, PICL and the, the analysis of that data. And uh, I will be presenting this coming Monday. I'm hoping to present on those three medical providers because that gives a unique insight into what can happen if this stuff can get diagnosed and treated early, which is unusual, right? We don't, don't normally get to uh, a diagnosis of CCI related to trauma within months and initiate treatment within months. So what happens when you do that? And the answer, I think, is you tend to see huge improvements um, based off a single treatment, primarily because um, the, the long-standing stuff that gets baked in hasn't had a chance to get baked in. Uh, Ulysses, is there, I heard there's a ligament, uh, not so much a ligament, but you could call it a connection between the rectus capitis posterior minor um, and the dura. Now there is the ventrodural ligament between C1, C2 that does jack into the dura. So I guess that that is correct. There is the ventrodural ligament. Okay, guys, sounds great. Have, have a great weekend, and I will see you all on Monday. Thank you.